And I'm going to start out with this little skyline behind me. This is the impossible skyline. And do they tell us the truth? Of course they tell us the truth. Does the government care about us? Of course the government cares. Is the coronavirus a legitimate pandemic? Of course it is perfectly legitimate. Everything they're telling us is the absolute truth. Welcome. And really, your comments shape my videos. This community is as good as it gets. I had originally planned on making a video on the World's Fair in Rio de Janeiro. And I will show what I've made so far. And this, I believe, is a cathedral in Mexico. Here she is again. Very important expenditure for the church. I'm sure there were no homeless people in this city at the time of its construction. Otherwise, the church would never dream of building something so magnificent. Here we can see the busy and bustling streets of Mexico, looking as if it's been abandoned for at least a hundred years. I could be wrong. I'm sure this photo was taken during the siesta hour, a very important function, and a perfect time to snap a picture. And here in this picture we see old doorways in this wall, blocked off long before the photo. And one more look at the cathedral, a very classic style, showing all the signs of the old world. Certainly nothing unique, but very beautiful. And a little look at the inheritors of this city coming to fill the vessels with water. They are nice vessels. This one seeming to have some straps. I'm very grateful to have this old world wonder still functioning after the reset. And here's what I was looking for. Some sort of World's Fair in Brazil. And look at these mud roads. Not even level. Before any construction would take place, that would be the first thing we would do. And what a beautiful place to be. And in 1908, they held the exhibition of the opening of the ports of Brazil. Not quite a world's fair, but having all the markers and characteristics of all the world's fairs we've looked at. It opened on August 11th, it stayed open for three months, and received over a million visitors. They're saying it was an unrecognized exposition, and no talk of construction, not a picture of construction and no mention of by whom or how it was even built. The usual narrative, always stressing who designed it and the buildings, as usual, not suiting their purposes. Palace of Mines, Industry, Botanical Garden. Here a little look at the Palace of Mines. And here we can see the Industry Pavilion. In the industry pavilion, having a very interesting story, we're told that it was first a military school, then it was used for this expo, and afterwards it was turned into the 3rd Infantry Regiment. And they tell us the States Pavilion, as seen here, is the only one that was permanent. And if I was designating these, naturally this would be a capital in the background. And I would make this one a courthouse. Of course, I'm joking. This looks like everything we see all throughout our realm. And this World's Fair seems very exciting. So that's it in a nutshell. Let's have a little look 
get some pictures up close. And here we see a little World's Fair ticket. In 1908, the exhibition Brazil. Totally mind blowing. Looking very old and seasoned and abandoned. And here the doorway to the monument and a glorious little structure. Very top heavy. And here we see the theater. A very beautiful theater. And a couple guys waiting for people to arrive. And here we can see the Pavilion of Mines, if I'm correct. Seeming like a rendering. And of course, this is how you would want to represent the mining industry. And a nice little postcard to send home. Letting the family know how much fun you're having at the World's Fair in Brazil. Seeing a lot of the same structures you may have had in your very own town. And here's that gateway all lit up. And here's their little industrial palace. Just a little guy. And here we can get a feel for how much fun this fair really was. I'm trying to imagine myself in this crowd looking around at these buildings and wondering what the hell this fair is all about. As usual, I'm looking for refreshments, souvenirs, and restaurants. And not really seeing any. And in this particular picture, it seems like we ran out of money, having to erect little tents. Perhaps this was the food court. And I don't need to mention how ridiculous this is. Nobody out on the water, and this might have been a few days before the fair. And here we have one last check, making sure the fountains are operational. And as usual, the roads will have to stay muddy in this exhibition. Certainly going over budget and just hoping that people show up. And a little look at the roads. Not sure if this is horse dung or just piles of dirt. Some bricks in the road. Just the thing to keep these fairgoers excited. I would have loved to have seen this city in its glory, seeing the actual builders and inhabitants. And this little castle is the governor's palace, really teched out. And finally, some refreshments. Let's just take a load off. And what do we have back here? Little amazing buildings built into the cliffside. And one last little parting look at the white city of Rio de Janeiro. A fine fair it must have been. At the very least, a great opportunity for a picture. The inheritance of Brazil. And this was shared in a comment in yesterday's video. And I absolutely thank you for this. Recommendation of a wonderful film. Released in 1975, a year before I was born. And this movie is called A Boy and His Dog, starring Don Johnson. And naturally, I didn't really know what to expect from this movie. And as it turns out, it's the best movie I've seen in a very long time. I seldom watch movies anymore. And by chance, this is one of the greatest truth drops in movies I have seen. Seeming so clear to anybody that does any mud flood or Tartaria research, this movie explains our past. And of course the timeline is off. Being set in the future, as if World War III has transpired, and we begin with this apocalyptic scene, just cooking the realm, 
and here giving us the date of 2024 AD. This is a perfect story of our past, yet portraying it as if it's something to come. And right at the beginning, we start out with these characters digging holes, a very Mad Max wasteland depiction. We see a telephone pole, just the very top sticking out. And the whole premise is that after the apocalypse, these guys dig holes. Why? Because all of civilization is buried under five to eight feet of mud. And this being such a Mad Max survival situation, people dig. They find the rooftops, bust through them, gathering food. All the preppers and whatever was left on the shelves before this apocalypse. And here we can see the rooftop, a shingle roof, and he's going in to the top of the home. And how would they know where to dig? Well, again, you have things poking up like this telephone pole. And entire neighborhoods perfectly preserved under the mud. And we're actually told that in this particular movie, they're in Phoenix. The big valley of Phoenix. And they barely know their history. In fact, this dog knows more about the history than his friend. And I absolutely love the story of this boy and dog. I highly recommend it. And the ending is my favorite. And here you have the notion of different groups of people in this post-apocalyptic scenario. This bastardly man enslaving these people and having them dig for him. Again, very Mad Max-like. And our hero ends up stealing some of their food to feed his dog. And there's a little makeshift movie theater in the desert at night where these travelers, survivors can gather. And this would be very exciting if you were living in such a scenario. Here his dog is trying to get a little popcorn from this guy. And ultimately, he meets a girl, what he thinks is by accident, and she ultimately tricks him, and he's led to this vault out in the desert, and it leads into an underground city. And in this underground city, everything being very wonderful seeming, very luxurious compared to what's going on at ground level, and yet all the people are very strange, living in this subterranean realm, painted white faces. And we come to find that this is ultimately just a big trick. And he, the main character, has been lured down here. Because these people can no longer reproduce. A condition of living underground for too long. And ultimately, luring this character down here to facilitate the repopulating of this underground civilization. Very fascinating. I highly recommend you watch it. And could somebody have known? Or was this just a fluke? Did they just become inspired? Or is this a truth drop? Even incorporating an AI character that this underground civilization uses to do their bidding. A disposable robot, like the Agent Smith. How will I share with you in such oppressive times? Here, of course, I can share in code. But as things become more pressing, we'll need another platform. And I have started a new one at the Odyssey slash library sites. And my videos will be available there for safekeeping. And I look forward to publishing some work that would be considered inappropriate on this particular platform. So just wanted to put that out there. And let's move on. And here, just super, super quick, 
I just wanted to talk about the recent Tartarian theory that the Mongolians were the children of Tartar, who were the Scythians, and before that were the Magogans. And recently somebody commented, and I can't find the comment again, it's like it's being hidden from me. The commenter's name was Kovacs Giza, and it sounded like he was from the city of Astana, or Nur Sultan in Kazakhstan. Forgive me, I think I said that wrong. And he says, the people you call Tartaria, we call ourselves the 24 Hun tribe. And it was a very fascinating comment, almost confirming everything that had been said. But this is a rabbit hole that will require another video. For today, I thank you so much for joining me, and do have a blessed day. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Testing, testing, I hope this works. And here I just wanted to jump in for a little bonus. This was recently a mystery object spotted in Utah, and I don't know, it's still very fresh and new, but I thought we'd just have a little look. Really less than 24 hours ago, this mystery metal monolith found by a flight crew in Utah wilderness. And this was sent to me by iHeart Fairies, and I thank you for this. Very difficult, it showed up on my phone and it did not show up on my computer. Not in my spam folder, just gone. And this is nothing short of 2001 Space Odyssey. Stupid monkeys discover this monolith in the desert, and in this case we are the monkeys. These guys have no idea what this is. And what we see is this wilderness crew was doing a helicopter flyby and one of the crew spots this object down in the canyon. They land the helicopter and go check it out. And here we can see where this is located. In this canyon in southeast Utah. And they're not revealing the location because they said they're worried that people might get stuck. Here possibly the greatest discovery in recent times. And frankly, I'm quite surprised that we even are seeing this. I'm going to follow this really carefully. Worried the Smithsonian is on their way. And here, once again, not giving us the exact location of this metallic monolith sticking out of stone. But they do show us this map, and with this little toy helicopter give us perhaps a little unintentional disclosure and i'm going to encourage everybody to hit the google earth if you're familiar with this area in person boots on the ground will be key and perhaps we just make a big group exploration out of this perhaps in between arches and the grand escalante national monument but once again, with this image, I think we should be able to spot it from above, at least find this canyon. And here we are. This crew has landed, and you can see the obelisk. Unbelievable that they even spotted it, because it really is right up by the canyon wall here. And I love when the mainstream has no explanations. They thought maybe some artists had put it here, but not seeming to be any path marks, no litter, and here now they're approaching it, and like I said, you can see where he's walking, and it's not very worn, and here we go. This thing just planted firmly into the rock. I just can't even believe they're showing this to us this morning. I'm very excited, and as we look back here, we see the signs of melted buildings window openings, and could this have been such a high quality metal that it was completely unaffected by this massive heat that cooked our realm. And these guys just get up here, putting weight on it, showing that it's nothing flimsy and nothing that's been recently put here by some artists. There we go. 
And here they get up here just to check it out a little further. Once again, the flight route that they supposedly took and an aerial view of what this landscape looks like. Some nubs, most likely from structures melted down to almost nothing. This great canyon here, another one here, probably will resemble Lichtenberg figures from the top. Massive heat and scar marks. And this must be fresh footage that they took. So here is a look at this sheer canyon wall and perhaps that's where the obelisk was found. Not at all what I was going to share this morning, but very exciting. And more breaking news. This was just sent to me a couple days ago. More on the monolith. Looks like people may have found the location of this monolith out in the Utah desert. And let's read what they have to say. Over the weekend, the team, of course, discovered the metal object. It's still a mystery to who put it there or why. But a group of eagle-eyed Reddit users have discovered the location on Google Earth. But just so we're clear, officials say you probably should not visit it. You'll end up putting yourself and others in danger. Not to mention needlessly bothering the nearby wildlife and traveling during a pandemic. So this is really telling me that this is something worth checking out. Already with these stupid discouragements. According to Google, satellite imagery, they say it appears to have been erected between 2015 and 2016. However, a spokesperson for the Utah Department of Public Safety speculated in the New York Times that it could have been there even longer, telling the paper, All we know is that it's been installed since the 40s and 50s. Somebody took the time to use some type of concrete cutting tool or something to really dig down almost the exact shape of the object and embed it really well. It's odd. The roads are close by, but to haul the material, to cut into the rock and haul the metal, which is taller than 12 feet in sections, is definitely a feat. It would be quite the expedition and not without risks. It's about an hour and a half drive from the nearest highway, with little more than half a mile of unpaved road to cover at the end of the journey. So this is great news. Not too far off. The location was initially kept under wraps by authorities to keep nosy trespassers at bay. First of all, let me remind you that these are public lands. Public. There are no nosy trespassers when the lands belong to the public. The exact location of the installation is not being disclosed, since it's a very remote area, and if individuals were to attempt to visit the area, there is a significant possibility that they may become stranded and require rescue. Absolute bastards. Officials are now calling for its removal, as it's illegal to install structures or art without authorization on federally managed public lands according to the statement. And these officials should all be fired for treating the public that they serve as if they're children. And please, anybody that has the coordinates to this location, leave them in the comments or email me before these cleansers of history have their way.